might notice my fancy sermon title is Latin. Mysterium Tremendum et Fascinans. It's a fearful and fascinating mystery. Is that how you regard the Lord's Supper? Or just a monthly ritual that we repeat? sometimes without giving it much thought. Now, we appreciate it, and we kind of know what we're doing, but we don't give it a lot of thought. The term mysterium tremendum et fascinans speaks to the otherness of God, which renders believers awestruck with holy and reverential fear, but at the same time, attracted to God's love and God's grace. When I first heard those phrase, that phrase applied to the consecrated bread and cup of Holy Communion, I was inspired to review my own understanding of the Lord's Supper. Raised in a church where communion services were held only twice a year, as the brethren spoke, and where the theological concepts of holy mysteries or reverential fear were not much discussed, I was willing to wrestle with them. And as I grew older, I came to cherish them, even that bit about reverential fear. Both, I believe, have deepened my Christian faith and enhanced my experience at the Lord's table. The Protestant denomination in which I was raised, the Grace Brethren Church, didn't care much for the notion of sacrament either. We call this important. What's the difference? What's the difference between a sacrament Very good, very good. I mean, in short, short form, a sacrament is a holy gift from God, meant to be consumed and enjoyed by His people. An ordinance is a command. It's a little cold part of the And I was raised in the church to talk about the ordinance of communion. Yes, Jesus said at the Last Supper, in so many words, I want you to do what I just showed you how to do every time you think about it. So that is kind of a command, a pretty soft command from Jesus. Thinking about this as, an, as, a, as a sacrament, I know it sounds a little too Roman really Catholic for some of you Baptists, but I think it's kind of spot on. One of two sacraments or ordinances, if you like, retained by the Reformers when they broke with Rome, the other was baptism. The Protestant understanding of communion was controversial almost from the get-go, a passionate and sometimes cantankerous debate developed among the early Protestant leaders as to just how Christians should interpret the words that Jesus spoke to his disciples as he broke the bread and passed around the cup at his last supper. Take, eat, Jesus said. This is my body. And as he passed the cup around, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant. What did those disciples think as they ate the meat at that time? More to the point, what do you think when you partake of the bread? We ask for blessing, Lord, on this time in your word. We pray, Lord, that you will specially prepare us for this sacrament this morning. That we might be ready for this church's next move. That we might be alerted to your presence with us, your, your plans for us, and the forgiveness of sins that you give us through your blood. We pray this in Jesus' name. This little history. The earliest mention in scripture of a communion service is recorded in the Apostle Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians. We just read that. And that was actually part of Paul's chastising that church for about how they had to mean communion. They made communion a party. Well, gee, shouldn't it be joyous? Yeah. yeah. A kind of a solemn, joyful experience. But it got kind of raucous. Church. People bought picnic lunches, and you had seats at the table where some.
some people brought a lot of money, brought a fine feast for their family, and they sat at their table with lots to eat. Other folks sat quietly and munched on some bread and water. Paul said, this should not be. And he laid out a very simple formula for the communion supper. Now, I was raised in Grace Brethren Church, and we had threefold communion. You know what that is? I know Kathy and Mike do. We had communion twice a year. One, one event was always on Sunday before Palm Sunday. And threefold communion begins with, ready for it? Feet washing. Yeah. We wash each other's feet. How many have never done that? I don't mean at home. I'm sure you wash your feet. But have you ever washed feet in church as an act of worship? An act of fellowship? When I was a kid, my first time, I was peeped out. I, was, I think I was like eight or nine. My dad said, "You go to church." And I said, "I have a I had been baptized. I had gone to the church when I was eight years old, so I went to the communion service. And uh, you know, at Grace Brethren Church, you sit at a table where there's a little bit of food to eat, not much. I mean, I thought maybe they'd bring up big food later. So we prayed, read some scripture, and went to different rooms. And where I was paired off with an old fellow, an old farmer in our church named Lance. And I sat down with Jesus and I watched the other people and they did. And they picked up those long towels wrapped around themselves. And they put a basin in the water. Every two chairs had one basin in the water. And they moved the basin under the feet of the person that they ministered to. And they got down their hands and knees and they actually put his feet in the water and rubbed their hands all over it. And then dried them off. And then the one on his knees stood up. These two men embraced and gave each other what they call an holy kiss. <laughs> and a hug. So I was ready to get out of there right away. <laughs> What's going on here? I was only, like I said, nine. I was the only boy there. So I washed all the women's feet. Now I'm going to tell you right now, I've said this, I probably shared it here, but I've shared it a thousand times. When old Amos, who was an old farmer, an old blue collar dude, put his foot in that water. Lots of things floated up to the surface. <laughs> I mean, I washed his feet. Now, you know what? As I look back on that years later, I think maybe that was done on the purpose. I think he was decided that day he would need his feet unwashed because this only washing will be good. I got through it, he all in himself. Oh, it's from the kisses on his roughly bearded face. And uh, my life was changed. We returned after we washed our hands very thoroughly. Returned back to the fellowship room where we sat down at the table, and we had what our pastor insisted was a love feast. As far as I was concerned, it was two pieces of cheese and some olives. Feast, come on. Yes, my dear. It was a sandwich. What kind of was a sandwich made? It was a cheese sandwich, right? It's a cheese sandwich. Yeah. Years later, at the Church of the Savior, where I pastored, we had a love feast by Jimmy. We had a Carrie love feast. It was, it was serious food, for sure. But we still began with feet washing. And then, of course, we closed the threefold service with the bread. So, to me, it was a really big deal for me. When I moved to a church where it became just the bread and the cup, and kind of done by rope, where people come up and gather around, and it happens in like three minutes, no one thinks about it. I had a little concern. Now, so that's, that's why I'm. Bringing this message this morning, and I'm on a short time clock here, so uh, let's get on. You need to learn the history of the, of, of the Lord's Supper in the Protestant tradition. Uh, you're amazed at how deeply it was argued, how fiercely and passionately it was discussed as the, as the church that emerged from the Roman Catholic Church tried to come to terms with this holy mystery. Is it a mystery or is it just a thing you do? I think it's a holy mystery. What does holy mean? All together. It means to be like nothing else you do. All together. You gather together with brothers and sisters in Christ. You experience this holy meaning. Paul said the community thought was fraught with danger. And so I asked myself, what constitutes the partaking of these elements? that might be unworthy, which makes one guilty of profaning the body and blood of Christ. You don't want to do that. I don't want to profane Christ's body and blood. I don't think I am, am I? In 
In his exhortation, Paul told his readers that they should take care to examine themselves before approaching the Lord's table. And that that examination should not only be reasonable, but imperative. That is why communion services in the churches where I pastor the included time of silent preparation will do that this morning. So how should we prepare? I got a four-step process. And this is just practical. First, when we start the service, after we reach a, per a certain place in the service, I'll ask you to close your eyes. Why? Just to remove every distraction that's the color of this woman's new dress, the shabby look of this chair, the odd thing that's going on in your home, whatever. Next, I'll ask you to confess your sins. Please confess me. What does it actually mean again? What does the word actually mean? It means to say again. God says you're a sinner. I say, yes, I'm a sinner. God said you need to confess that. Yes, I need to confess that. Third, empty yourself. That's the tricky part. How am I getting all Eastern about this? I mean, simply try to clear from your mind everything except the moment. Everything except the holy business that is at hand. And fourth, think. Why do we do this? Why am I doing this? Should I be doing this? And Paul says, you should examine yourself before taking the bread and the cup. I think Paul means very clearly, if you are not worthy to receive the bread and cup, don't come up and take it. Because once, I, once again I say there are holy mysteries swirling around this table. Paul says, better to sit back in your chair and pray. I'm not, I'm not disinviting anybody from the table. But I'm reminding you how serious this business is. And the reformers were all over this. The reformers, Martin Luther could think of first, they thought that the Roman church had polluted the Lord's table. And one of the things they thought was wrong was the doctrine of transubstantiation. The Romans believed that as we partake from the bread and the, and the cup, that the bread becomes the real flesh of Christ. And the cup becomes the real blood of Christ. And the Romans said, no, no, that's way over the top. But then debates woke up, how should we do this? How should we see this? Luther, who was a member of a Roman Catholic monk, when he broke away from the church to begin the Red Reformation, some believe. He called what was happening here sacramental union. Somehow the body and blood of Christ are, are truly and substantially present, but they're not really flesh and blood. His followers gave that understanding of meaning consubstantiation with the elements. John Calvin believed that the real presence of Christ's body and blood are not brought physically to the table, but he said, quote, the Holy Spirit truly unites things that are separated in space, a teaching variously described as pneumatic presence or receptionism. Even Zwingli, he came up with an understanding of the Lord's Supper, which is closer to us than it's the one the Anabaptists kind of face our beliefs. That this is a memorial. This is just a cup of juice. This is just a piece of bread. Don't get all mystical about that. We are simply repeating what happened the Lord's last night when he said, as often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. So we just remember that. No mystery, just a reenactment. And that's how I was raised. And probably how you thought. To me, did I go a little rough? I don't know. No. I think that the Lord has something else in mind. And we have the Holy Spirit that gives us the power to worship by means of the sacrament in ways that may not be as nutty as transforming these things into flesh and blood. But make room for a holy mystery. That's why we just do this. We miss churches once a month, and the Romans do this every time they meet. But once a month, we are called upon 
to wrestle with the profound eternal ramifications of our Lord's death on the cross, of his resurrection and his promise to return. To wrestle with the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place, in our lives, as we partake, to make this something more than just a repeated remembrance of something that happened 2,000 years ago. John Wesley came up with that thing. Good way to think about this. I got a quote here from John Wesley's The Methodist Church's uh, Bylaws. Jesus Christ, he writes, is truly present in Holy Communion. Through him and in the power of his Holy Spirit, God does meet us at the table. God, who has given the sacraments to the church, acts in and through Holy Communion. Christ is present in the community together, is he not? We celebrate Jesus here with us by means of the Holy Spirit. Christ is present in the community, gathered in Jesus' name, through the word proclaimed and enacted, through the elements of bread and wine shared. The divine presence is a living reality and can be experienced by all the participants. It is more than a remembrance. He wrote. More than a remembrance more than a remembrance of the Last Supper and the Crucifixion. So, I say it's a design, a divine sign. It is a mystery, mystery, because God is present here. It is a sign that teaches us again, reminds us again of our Lord's sacrifice. Of our coming to God through faith in our Lord's blood shed on the cross. And we get to celebrate that. Like he asked us to on this last night on earth. Now, some Christians do not embrace the notion of an all encompassing sacred fellowship of Christians. Uh, accordingly, they are careful about the company they keep. I've been, I've been in churches where people ask, if you are not a Christian, please don't come forward. If you are on the outs in some way in your Christian life, please don't come forward. That might be good advice. You know what? God is merciful. He is just. He loves us. He loves it when we worship Him. And I said that all the time. Nothing will happen here that will offend anyone. You certainly don't offend God. And you're given time in this service to confess your sins. So I would say let all come to the table. I believe that this moment is for the church and it's for our Lord. It is maybe the closest we come to heaven in our worship. So I ask you, if you don't want to leave, I hope you do, that they've got your, your communion liturgy. It might be on the board. These guys are, these guys are amazing. It might not be. Celebration of communion, I hope you got this. It's an insert in your bulletin. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He chose us before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his heirs through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Amen. Let us pray from the book of common prayer. In unison. O Lord, our God, our Creator, and our Judge, prove every day yet strong and patient. Forgive, we beseech you, our forgetfulness of your law, our complacency and apathy, our culpable ignorance, our tolerance of intolerable wrongs. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, and turn our hearts through Christ Jesus our blessed Lord and Savior, amen. Now, let us keep silence.
forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. That's just like the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.